Last night, I posted two questions for Mansoor Maliki. One, what is my status under Islamic law? In other words, if I suddenly found myself living in a country governed by Islamic law, what would happen to me? Two, if I repented and even converted to Islam, what would my status be under Islamic law? Mansoor posted his response on Twitter. Let's check it out. Responding to David Wood's two questions, and there's a link to my video. As for your status under Islamic law, then, since you don't pay the jizya or have any protection from the Muslims, there is no sanctity to your blood. This is even without insulting the Prophet or Islam. But since you have insulted the Prophet, if America did become an Islamic entity, then you shouldn't be given the option of jizya. If the Muslims gave you the option of jizya and you accepted, then I'm not too sure what would happen. I think the idea here is that since I've insulted Muhammad, Muslim leaders aren't supposed to give me the option of becoming a dhimmi. But if a Muslim leader mistakenly offered me a dhimmi contract and we all signed it, there's a question of what would happen once they realize that a mistake has been made. Should they honor the contract and not kill me, or should they execute me as they were supposed to do? In general, the scholars consider the dhimmi who insults the prophet to have broken his contract and, as such, liable for execution, although the Hanafis do differ. See the following link for proofs regarding killing the one who insults the prophet. I'll put that link in the description box for anyone who wants to read the proofs. As for the second question, the only way one could repent would be by accepting Islam. In this case, to my knowledge, the majority accept the repentance. That's what I thought. Although they may differentiate between the one who repents on their own and the one who does so under the fear of the sword. I am a Maliki, and to my knowledge, in the Maliki school, your repentance would not be accepted, although if sincere, it would benefit you in the next world. In a practical sense, it would come down to the judge presiding over your case, and it's impossible for me to say what madhab the judge will adhere to in this theoretical scenario. Although I suspect a Muslim judge who did follow the opinion that repentance can be accepted may well defer the case to a judge who doesn't or give ruling according to the opinion that your repentance isn't accepted. And Allah knows best. So that would be my status under Islamic law from a legal perspective. Mansour goes on to offer some justification for the Islamic view. He says, this was for the fiki part now some people asked me to develop, to understand better. The following things must be understood. We are coming from a paradigm where salvation is linked to becoming Muslims. In such a situation to allow for people to insult the prophet is to jeopardize the salvation of an entire people, which is worse than unjust murder or any other heinous act. Notice. From an Islamic perspective, insulting Muhammad is worse than unjust murder or any other heinous act. So insulting Muhammad would be worse than genocide. Further, it must be noted that similar punishments exist in the Old Testament, and as such, it is strange for Christians or Jews to object on moral grounds. Not really. There were certain kinds of blasphemy laws that applied to people under the Old Covenant, but that was for a particular group of people in a particular place at a particular time, people who entered into a specific covenant with God. There was a covenant, an agreement that God would bless them in certain ways and that they, in return, wouldn't violate certain commands. Applying the penalties of this covenant to people who were never part of the covenant makes absolutely no sense from a biblical perspective. Apart from that, the people who entered into the covenant were people who had witnessed indisputable miracles. So if they blasphemed the God who produced those miracles, they knew they were breaking a covenant with the one true God. 
This is very different from people who've never seen any reason to believe in Muhammad being killed for criticizing Muhammad. As for Christians, the harshest penalty the church can enforce is excommunication. In other words, if you were committing all kinds of blasphemy, the final step for Christians would be telling you that you're no longer part of the church. The Christian response would be, hey, if you really don't want to honor God, there's the door. So we're not being inconsistent if we object to the idea of imposing blasphemy laws around the world on people who don't believe in your religion or your prophet. Additionally, we could turn the consistency issue against you, Mansur. Your prophet mocked the gods of the pagans of Mecca. When he conquered Mecca, he smashed the idols with a stick. Why did he do that? Because he didn't believe in them and he wanted to show his contempt for false gods. So the example we have from your prophet is that it is acceptable to mock and insult the gods and sacred symbols of religions that you reject. The only people who can really object morally are atheists, yet even they have the problem that there is no objective morality. As such, there is no rational reason to reject Islam on account of these rulings. Also consider, if a Christian wants to fight Muslims in their own country like David Wood is doing in America, I've never fought a Muslim in my life, and he breaks his pacts and insults Allah, he would be killed. But that would be stupid from him because he knew that he'd be killed for that. It's like some kind of suicide from his part. Someone under Sharia law does not insult Allah the same way someone under Vladimir Putin's law does not insult Putin. Now, one has to understand that Putin has no right to be a sacred individual. He's just a grown-up spermatozoid created by Allah. Only Allah and his religion are sacred. Allah is not to be respected because he asked the people to, but because it is his right as the creator of all of us. One does not insult his own creator, its basic conduct and decency to have as a normal human being. Likewise, when Allah makes the honor of someone sacred, like that of the prophets, to insult them is to rebel against Allah who must be obeyed. The punishment that Allah sets for this crime is the most just, as it is only his right to decree how things should be responded to and how people must act. We don't authorize people to insult Allah or his prophets because it is an abominable act. How could this kind of act be? As we love our Creator, we cannot let people insult him publicly. This kind of hideous act has no place to be under our law. If David Wood accepts people to insult God under his Christian law, well, we don't. And of course, no Christian in the past would be pleased that Jesus be insulted, yet today they accept and are pleased that everyone have the freedom to, which shows their lack of concern with God. Notice this last part. No Christian would be pleased that Jesus be insulted, so how can Christians be pleased with freedom of speech? According to Mansour, not killing people for what they say about God shows that you lack concern about God. This is why it's good to have a discussion like this. It allows us to pinpoint some of our disagreements. Mansoor, you say only Allah and his religion are sacred. From a Christian perspective, human life is sacred because human beings are created in the image of God. Jesus commanded us to love everyone, including our enemies. The Apostle Peter ordered us to honor all people. In the book of James, James, the half-brother of Jesus, is talking about the damage that people do with our words, with our tongue. He says, with it, with the tongue, our speech, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. 
In other words, if you understand that it's wrong to curse God, why would you curse your fellow human being who, like you, is created in the image of God? The point here is that from a Christian perspective, you're not honoring God by going around killing and subjugating and enslaving people who are created in his image, people you've been commanded to love and to honor. God is patient with human beings and with our many shortcomings. So who are you, Mansoor, to oppress and enslave and slaughter the bearers of his image? The other issue is the issue of freedom. Can I appreciate a freedom that some people will use for something that I don't like? Absolutely. Mansoor, you're on Twitter literally promoting the subjugation of everyone who rejects Islam. Do I like what you're saying? Not a bit. Do I like the fact that you're allowed to say it so that people can see for themselves the difference between Islam and other positions? Absolutely. So there's no inconsistency between liking a freedom and not liking what other people do with that freedom. I could obviously say a lot more about freedom of speech and the issues laid out here, but I don't want this video to be too long. I thank Mansoor for answering my questions and for not trying to deceive us by misrepresenting Islam, unlike certain other people we're familiar with. Mansoor, if it's not too much, I do have one more question. Just to be clear, I have no intention of pestering you with a bunch of questions. I only have one more question, a very sincere question about your disagreement with Sheikh Uthman. There's part of your discussion with Sheikh Uthman where I actually agree with Sheikh Uthman, but I'd like to ask you about it in case I'm wrong. Lord willing, I'll post my question about that tomorrow, and if you get a chance to respond, I'd be very interested in what you have to say.